Watts Gallery is never completely quiet. Even if you are the only visitor, just listen and you can hear whispers of words, snatches of stories and songs. Where are they coming from? From the places and the faces that you can see all around, inside the picture frames or carved in stone. Every single sculpture or drawing, print or painting, has a different story to tell and wants to tell it just for you. Let's find a story and tell it together. I can see one. Look at this painting. Can you imagine stepping inside the picture frame with me? Look around. Where could we be? Behind the person is a stone frieze, a long carved decoration. Have you ever seen something like this? Can you remember where? Perhaps in another gallery or inside a museum? And what is the person standing on? Let's zoom in and take a closer look. Is it a map or perhaps a drawing? And let's look up from the shiny shoes to the soft, rich velvet jacket and beautiful blue waistcoat. He is looking down, lost in his own thoughts. Perhaps you could copy this pose. Who is this? What can we tell about them? This is someone who likes exciting colours. This is someone interested in museums and paintings. This is someone rather thoughtful. In fact, this is an artist and his name is George Frederick Watts. Where have you heard that name before? It is the name of the gallery. Watts Gallery. Over 200 years ago, back when all stories were true, George Frederick Watts was born in the heart of a busy city, London. London was full of hustle and bustle. The river so filled with ships, you could jump from the deck of one onto the deck of another like stepping stones. The mazes of small houses with as many as fifty to a room. The forests of chimney pots puffing out smoke and steam. The narrow lanes crowded with carriages, carts and market stalls as far as the eye could see. Streets aglow with the white glare of gas lamps flaring up into the air and the eerie red gleam of grease lamps. Storytellers said the streets of the city were paved with gold and if you wanted to be rich you had to travel there and see for yourself. And so many did, tumbling into the city in search of riches. George's family wasn't particularly rich at all. His father made pianos and tuned them for a living and did not make a lot of money. He did make music though, and named George after his favourite composer, George Frederick Handel. Although George never really did like his own name. Do you like your name? I do. George's father really wanted to be an inventor of new musical instruments and become rich and famous, but he never did. 
Although the city was busy and noisy, with cries of the market traders, the hooves of the horses, the church bells chiming the hour, and people always hurrying and scurrying, George was rather lonely. He was sometimes unwell, and so had to stay home from school, far away from his friends. His father would be out working, and his mother, sometimes unwell too, slept all day in her room. But friends can find us in unexpected ways. George made a friend when it tapped upon his window pane one spring. It was a little dusty brown London sparrow. George loved it and taught it tricks. Soon the sparrow was trained to perch on George's head and share food from his plate. And on some days the little sparrow would fly from George's room out of the window and soar into the London skies above the gardens of the square and wait for George to follow. And so he did. George headed out into the city, into a magical world. One cold grey afternoon, when the clouds sat upon the rooftops, the sparrow led George to a museum, the British Museum, and George wandered round in wonder. There was so much to see. He particularly liked a collection of Greek marble sculptures known as the Elgin Marbles. In fact, in this painting, that is where he is standing, in front of the Elgin Marbles. George returned to the museum many times to study them. When George was just ten, a sculptor called William Venice began to train him to teach him how to sculpt. William was the son of a piano maker too, and soon William, his brother Charles and George were the best of friends. George began to study and work hard. His hand was never still, always scribbling or sketching something. His own face, those he saw around him. He could never remember a time when he did not draw. He would wake up very early, as soon as his sparrow began to sing that the sun was up. He never wanted to waste a single moment of the daylight. And so, sometimes, he didn't actually go to bed at all, but would roll himself into his thick dressing gown and lie on the floor and wait for sunrise. He would get up with the first rays of the sun every morning for the rest of his life. George walked through the city, his sketchbook always in hand, and soon, to his great delight, people began to buy his drawings. He was making money, and one day he painted this. Who do you think it is? How does he look? Look at the rather long tangle of brown hair. And look at the face, with the large, shining eyes and dreamy look. Did you guess? It's George. This is one of the first paintings George made of himself. It is a self-portrait. George's teacher, William, sent George's drawings to the head of an important London art gallery, the Royal Academy. And when he was 18, at the end of April 1835, George went to study there. And very soon, he had his own studio which he filled with paper and paints and songs that he would sing at the top of his voice. 
George's dream had come true. He was an artist, and he was surrounded with friends. He would never be lonely again. And as he sang for joy, his voice was joined by another. Somewhere, high above the city's noise, a sparrow called to his friend.